Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot coming at you with the week on the We uh, we skipped last week. Yeah, um, it wasn't intentional. Uh, well, it became kind of intentional, more of a necessity than an intention. But yeah, um, money's a thing. Money was a thing, you know. But uh, <clears throat> so we'll be covering last week's comics today, and here in a couple days, uh, we'll, th we'll be doing comics from this most recent week. So, getting started with, like I said, last week's books, we're kicking these off with Amazing Spider-Man number 10, tie-in to AXE Judgment Day. Now, I'll go ahead and say it, this comic literally brought, brought me to tears when I, when I read it, so we're, I'm kind of be, I'm gonna be trying to go through it quickly. So, um, the Celestial is judging everyone. Everyone. That includes Peter Parker. The way the Celestial tends to judge people is by appearing as important people in those people's lives. Um, for example, Emma Frost was judged by all of the students she who have died under her care. Um, Miles Morales was apparently judged by Peter Parker. Clint Barton was judged by a combination of uh, Black Widow and Luke Cage. So, if you if you does the cover kind of makes it clear, Peter Parker is judged by Gwen Stacy. Um, but Peter Peter's checking up on the people he cares about, making sure they're okay. Um, including you know, Aunt May, who is also being judged. By Uncle Ben. So, yeah, she got to see Uncle Ben. Um, but, uh, first checks on, Ra on Randy Robertson, who, you know, doesn't, you know, he's just like, yeah, whatever. But, uh, his, his girl, his fiance, Janice Lincoln, aka the Beatle, She's just like, yeah, okay, sure. There's a celestial judging us, whatever. But so, yeah, Randy has to go get his tuck from the wedding. Peter helps him with that, and yeah, he also, like I said, goes check in on May, uh, spends some time with her, checks in on Jameson, who <laughs> very clearly has to say, "Look, I'm doing good things. I'm being nice." I'm not a terrible person. Do you see me being a nice person, Celestial? Tries to check in on, on Ben Riley, but, well, yeah. He checks in on Miles. And you know, basically, he's proud to share the, share the name with uh, with him. The next day, he go he goes into work. Uh, his his Kamala, Kamala, Kamala Khan, his lab assistant, is uh, working on their project and is also in the midst of being judged by Carol Danvers. And the boss comes in. That's right, Norman Osborn. The Celestial leaves, though, uh... Peter follows and explains what's going why he, you know, why he's working for Norman Osborn. Generally, that, you know, he's trying to... that Osborn has managed to get himself a clean slate, and he wants to help make sure that Osborn doesn't become, once again, become the man who killed Gwen Stacy. And... Peter admits that he still loves Gwen. He's affirmatively judged and given a, and even given a gift by the Celestial. Um, a moment with Gwen. And just like that, it's over, though. Um, however, 
the moment was seen by someone else. It was seen by Norman Osborne, who tell who, who you know, it's like, okay, yeah, pull together, pull together, everything's fine. But it seems as though he's also being judged by the celestial in the form of Gwen Stacy. That is where the issue ends. This was this, this was great. Um, and yeah, not really focusing on on, on it is it, it's 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 moving. You know, it, it's yeah. It was a great issue through and through. Uh, one of the best uh, tie-ins to a major to an event crossover I've seen to date. Moving on to our next book, though, we've got Avengers X-Men Eternals Judgment Day Avengers. This was a one shot, this is one of three one shots, each one focusing on on uh, the various groups involved in Judgment Day. Um, so, three members of the Eternals. Three members of the X-Men and Iron Man are trying to base upon the off switch inside the progenitor. Iron Man is uh, feeling distinctly outnumbered as it's a you know an Avengers X-Men Eternals team up, and well, he's the only Avenger there. Though Wolverine and Cer Cersei both point out they've been Avengers before. And Sinister states that he, if uh, Iron Man's out of a recruitment drive, he gets there signing up. But, uh, they have to deal with antibodies of the Celestials. Um, Sinister has some uh, pheromones that disguise him when he uh, plundered the Dreaming Celestial. But they just make the antibodies within the progenitor mad. So, yeah. Plan B, stab, Logan stabs them. But some of the antibodies get to uh, to Tony, and uh, he was basically, he gets super judged. Yinsen, his armors, Cap, War Machine, Thor, with uh, the really being pointed out that if you know he had man if he had managed to hold off on his uh, psychotic his uh, divine psychotic break uh, when he you know killed all a bunch of his allies as the Iron God, you know maybe he could have. Uh, Gone toe to toe with the celestial, you know, in a way that would actually have mattered. But with the, with the vision of Thor saying, if only Tony had managed to hold together a few more weeks. But, uh, the vision of the Hulk and Wasp and Black Widow and Hellcat, I think also Pepper. He relives the accident that killed his parents. Um, apparently, he'd always hoped it would have been an assassination. And of course, people have claimed it was, or that his parents faked their deaths, or. But he says, yeah, as that's what orphans do, make up stories that give a bit of drama, give a reason. But it was just a car crash. Which, to be fair, uh, nice, nice change of pace for Marvel to kind of, you know, not, you know, to to not uh, retcon something or retcon things to match up to line up with the movies. I'm not saying either one is a is a bad origin. I, I, or is a bad plot point. I think they both work, but yeah. 
but the final vision he receives is a vision of none other than his father. And the vision says that um, he couldn't be prouder of uh, Tony. But this reinvigorates Tony and um, so he explains that Miss Lesha was testing him and is still testing all of them. And is still testing them, they're going to pass. They're going to save everyone. And that is where the issue ends. So this, is, this is good. Um, the, I, the stuff focusing on Tony was, you know, what was. Yeah. I hate to say it felt fairly par for the course for Iron Man stories. Um, you know, oh, gee, look at, you know, Tony acknowledging, oh, I'm kind of a crap, I'm kind of a shit person. <laughs> oh, look at all the emotional debris I've left in my wake. Oh, look at all the terrible, look at all the terrible things I've, I've, I've literally done. Oh. But it, it was, there was a moment, it was the moments with the other characters that I, I thought, I think were actually best parts. I'm a little biased, of course, as I find the sassy take on Sinister to be extremely amusing, so yeah. Moving on to our next book, we've got X-Men number 15, which is not an AXE tie-in. The Vault. So we open with a quote from Forge. Governments ask you to build terrible things. It's up to the scientists to weigh what's worse. Having that new toy or not having it. So we find out what it is that uh, the, the secret project Forge has been working on for the Quiet Council. It's a big gun to fire at the vault. Should it reopen? Cyclops upon finding it states that uh, it's a big gun and if Cable sees it, he's going to want it. Um... Forge explains that the payload is a very small bullet. If the vault opens, it's going to fire, fire a baby black hole at light speed into the opening doors, and then it will collapse and take the vault into the great unknown. Um, Forge and Psychops argue a bit about the ethics of it, as it would basically be exterminating the thousands of post-humans within the vault within the vault but then the vault opens but something goes wrong the gun doesn't fire immediately forge but it turns out to the base just be kind of a, a simulation of what would happen if the, if the vault uh, opened and and the uh, children of the vault unleashed. Explain that Krakoa falls less than a day after the vault opened, which was a, a record. The Avengers went down swinging as well. Doom is apparently the uh, the only one in the uh, the only one killed that doesn't give the children of all the satisfaction of a screen in the simulation. Then they move on to Asgard. And then back to... Re Turns out the whole thing was... Up to this point had been a, uh, a run-through of what would happen should the vault open between Xavier and Forge. 
but they found something better than the giant gun. So, Forge has placed the, the children of the vault and the vault into a reality of his own making. But uh, that, that's what happened. They, the children of the vault opened and they walked right into the simulation. War for days, but they're alive and well in there and think they're the masters of the universe. But it turns out there's, there's another element of this mission. It's a rescue mission. They're going in to save Darwin. Um, Magic explains the vault situation to, uh, to Firestar. Sync is apparently on monitor duty. But uh, the X Men get ready and go into the and go into the vault in combat suits, dealing with uh, apparently the uh, barrier set up is designed very much in a similar manner to manner to crack on gates. Only mutants can pass can pass through the barrier. Pro the project has near at least five inhabitants. And uh Apparently, the suit that Forge is wearing to uh, mitigate the effects of it, of Black Box is largely made of the mutant Caliban. I imagine this is uh, it, it works with Caliban's mutant tracking abilities. Uh, but it does appear while Forge flies off in, into the vault, well, and states that no one even knows he's there. Someone at least sees him. That is where the issue ends. The vault uh, plot line is definitely an interesting one. And I, I'm glad to see it uh, revisited. Um, also glad that they're at least trying to get uh, Darwin out. So, yeah, solid issue. Um, kind of dug the idea of for initially being a. Uh, the first half of the issue or so being basically a simulation and you know of what would happen. But yeah. Anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got Gambit number three. Where we'd left off. Storm had been uh, taken prisoner by um a local a local developer uh and crime Crime boss and his dummy Salazar's. Salars. Um, but uh, Storm had been taken prisoner alongside uh, a woman who had helped Gambit Storm, Marissa de, Ca Marissa de Castro, uh, the, well, her mother, uh, Dr. Ga Gabriella Castro had were taken prisoner by Solaris and so and it seemed that uh, Marissa and Gambit had, had been killed by uh, Warhawk Solaris super powered uh, enforcer but they're fine and in fact it's been suggested they switch clothes Gambit going for a uh, more black ops style bodysuit while Marissa wears 
Gambit's outfit, and we get some uh, explanation of the uh, tactic of how how the bodysuit works. It's the uh, upper torso portion is body armor. The headband is also body armor. But the plan is that uh, versus the going to be the uh, distraction. Which draws out Warhawk and leads her getting a decent beating in his hands. Of course, he, he realizes that she's a distraction. He goes after Gambit, who's already inside dealing with Solars and trying to rescue Storm and uh, Gabriella. But, uh,. They're all the DeCastros are, 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 survive, and uh, Remy and Storm get back on the road. Though the bounty, the intergalactic bounty hunters, just in the first issue, bounty. Is getting has gotten some information from uh, Salars about Remy, and she is still trying to find him. And that is where the issue ends. Nice to see that. Nice to see that uh, the, the Lila Cheney uh, plot point is being followed up on. Um, I understand why it was kind of thrown in there with, without a uh, immediate follow up because, you know, like, hey, you know, you got it's a mini series. It was planned to be a mini series. This, this wasn't the kind of thing where, you know, oh, this was supposed to be an ongoing and it lasts only, you know, a dozen issues and not all the plot points get that gets that get seated get picked up on. So yeah. But anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got Han Solo and Chewbacca, number six. Where we left off, Rio had apparently killed Han, and Chewbacca was in prison. Oh, and the thought has been impounded. Yeah. So, uh, Chewie is uh, dealing with... Well, he's in prison dealing with uh, the other inmates. While, while Maz Kanata watches. But uh, one of the inmates he's fighting is distracted by a uh, young woman named Phaedra. Who, um, who's in for... A lot. A very long list of uh, offenses. Um, at the Imperial Impound Facility in the uh, Derland system, Corbus, the man masquerading as, uh, who had been masquerading, pretending to be Han's father, is trying to find the Falcon and the uh, Urn. No, she gets, but uh, with uh, an assist from Tonga. Yes, Tonga from Bounty Hunters. This is you know we get to see her in her younger days, but uh, Kel's crew manages to begin their infiltration. They set their plan into motion. But the Falcon, they find the Falcon, and it's got a docking clamp. So, yeah. Chewie can use the prison fights. What uh, turns out Phaedra has a plan that involves uh, to escape, which partially involves uh, two of the other inmates, Dr. Evazan and Ponda Baba. But uh, Kel and her crew escape. Corbus checks the Falcon and. Uh, the urn's not there. Maz uh, discusses Phaedra's plan with Chewie, but apparently, uh, small hitch. The plan requires Chewie to die. 
Meanwhile, um, and the plane starts to go off with uh, Ebizon and Ponobob are, are being are about to be taken for uh, to be ex executed um, for their very for their their de or how their death sentence is carried out. But uh, Ponobaba kills one of the guards, and uh, the two of them are are informed that uh, the new homicide indictment. They have a new homicide indictment, so that means yeah, yet another death sentence to add to their record. On the planet Escalon in the Outer Rim, a healer has uh, found a human who washed up, washed him ashore. And they've been able to do what some, some to, to help him. Not entirely familiar with the with the with the human's biology, but the, he's at least come to at least enough to say a few words that make no sense at all. Han Solo, which is who this mysterious patient is. And that is where the issue ends. So apparently, I, I was uh, mistaken about this about the series. It was I thought it was going to be a mini series, but uh, it, it's apparently not. Anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got Doctor Afra number twenty four. Where we left off. Uh, Afra was uh, under the control of the Spark Eternal, and her her mind had been uh, kind of pushed into the Spark, while the Spark controlled her body. Meanwhile, uh, Sonastavros was uh, Sonastavros was had gathered together some uh, for past aso some past associates of uh, Doctor Afra in an attempt to try and get her. So. Within the uh, the spark, Doctor Evans is living out her some of her memories uh, when she's rescued by a Chatter fan with the who also apparently has the spark eternal. And so, but Afra is saved from that and ends up in one of the Chatter fan's uh, memories. Um, Beruke. Afra's droids Triple Zero and BT One are dealing with uh, Sana and her her group, but uh, but Sana manages to uh, make make an offer to them that would allow them to you know murder a whole bunch of people. The Charger fan manages to escape, in part due to. Uh, Yeah, we're doing something that kind of irritates her. But, uh... And basically she ends up seeing the history of the, uh, ascendant, the Ascendancy and the creation of Spark Eternal. While... Afra is working on... A Sith Killer weapon. When she's rolled up on by uh, Ariel, Ariel, you and just lucky. And that is where the issue ends. Things are definitely getting interesting, to say the least. It's nice. It, it's nice seeing other members, of other uh, less lesser utilized uh, Star Wars aliens in, in uh, products such as you know the China fan. Moving on to our last book for a moment, we've got Just League vs. League of Superheroes, number six. Where we left off, the mastermind be behind the great darkness was revealed to be none other than Vandal Savage. So, the issue begins in the Old West. Um, Vandal Savage is sheriff of a small town. And in his uh, jail cell is Batman. And he explains that uh, yeah, he basically he basically managed to he created the Great Darkness to rid the timeline of uh, the Age of Heroes, making for a better world. The Old West at the time point as a pivotal time point. 
because of Jonah Hex. Hex is brought to the sher to Sheriff Savage and promptly killed. But he, as he explains to Batman, uh, it turns out that, um, well, it's all been a trick. The Legion and the League tricked Savage. In the future, he's brought before the Guardians of Oa and tried. Their uh, plan is to, uh, they, they intend, the intention is to send them to non-existence. But uh, he manifests a gold ring and attacks the League and the Legion. Um, gold Lantern stops him and the ring that Savage created was, is also destroyed and it's decided that there will be a Gold Lantern Corps led by uh, Kalalur. But uh, before the the, uh, the League goes back to the present, they, ha they have a bit of a celebration with the League, or with the Legion. Um, but it's also, Brainiac kind of says, hey, we need to, you know, maybe not do any time travel anymore. There's been a lot of damage to the uh, space time continuum, so... In the past, the issue under the flashback to the Wild West, where uh, Jonah Hex finds a man uh, slumped against a tree and offers to get to get him some soup and fix him right up. And yes, it's Vandal Savage. And that is where the issue ends. The series as well, I believe. Uh, this, was, this was an interesting series. I honestly thought it was going to tie in more to uh, uh, Dark Crisis, and I, I kind of feel like having it be about the Great Darkness was a kind of shady thing. It was a decent series, though. Um, the usual Bendis complaints about, uh, apply about how much, how a lot of the characters don't don't seem to have their own voice. They, they all seem to... Ha yeah. It, 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 some of the characters just feel off in their speech patterns, but yeah. Um, anyway, overall, I, I, I enjoyed the book. Um, like I said, I... I, I kind of wish maybe it had been a uh, Dark Crisis lead-in, but oh well. Seeing as how, you know, we're a month from the conclusion of Dark Crisis, eh, I'm going to not have a, a tie-in, so. But uh, anyway, that is going to do it for now. As always, feel free, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal account in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, live long and rock hard.